Thank you for joining BD as we present vascular access issues in the critically ill. COVID-19 is changing how we approach care for the critically ill and practices for obtaining vascular access can be on the forefront of clinical concerns. Today, we will dive into two recently published studies that question old practices and offer considerations for vascular access device use. Presenting is Dr. Marsha Ryder, an independent collaborative researcher and consultant in medical biofilm healthcare-related infections. She is also a nationally and internationally recognized expert in the use of management and vascular access devices. Dr. Ryder's extensive experience in nursing includes positions as clinical director of a special care unit and a cardiovascular thoracic unit, clinical nurse specialist in nutrition support, and director of nursing in home infusion. She has served as past president of the Association of Vascular Access, past chair of APIC Scientific Research Council, former member of the FDA's Central Venous Catheter Working Group, and represented AVA on a technical advisory panel of the International Joint Commission CLABC project. Dr. Ryder was honored as the recipient of the 2007 Educator of the Year Award by Infection Control Today and the 2017 Suzanne Herbst Award for Excellence in Vascular Access. She currently serves as the president of the AVA Foundation for Patient Safety. Following Dr. Ryder, Dr. Gregory Shears will present his recently published meta-analysis comparing peripherally inserted central catheters and centrally inserted central catheter complications. Dr. Gregory Shears, MD, is a pediatric intensivist and anesthesiologist from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has a long-standing interest in reducing patient complications and improving approaches to vascular access. He is the physician liaison to the nurse-led PIC team, medical director of the ECMO service, and co-director of the congenital heart unit at Mayo Clinic. As a professor of anesthesiology, Dr. Shears has given hundreds of presentations locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally on vascular access topics. He is a current member of the Association for Vascular Access and served as treasurer for the AVA Board of Directors from 2015 to 2018, and he is on the editorial board for the Journal of the Association of Vascular Access. I will now turn it to you, Dr. Ryder. Well, thank you for that introduction, Cheryl, and welcome to our session today. Well, CLABSI has certainly been on the radar of every intensive care unit in the United States, but we have made progress over the recent years. In fact, it's, we have decreased now by 26%. So how do we attest for that? Avoidance of central venous catheters could be one of those issues that accounts for some of this success and the move to peripheral access devices, including the midline catheter. Well, I, a little bit of history on midlines. There were some reports of midlines prior to the 1990s, but it was primarily commercialized in the early 1990s. But by the mid 1990s, midlines fell out of grace due to the increased complication rates, in particular thrombosis and thrombophlebitis. But about 10 years later, they were reintroduced into practice. And part of this was due to the uh, new technology of catheters, as well as the increased use of ultrasound for placement. Well, moving on then to a few years, changes in the infusion standards that supported the wider use of peripherals in relation to drug administration. And then by 2018, financial penalties surrounding collapses further increased the midline utilization. Well, what were some of those changes in the drug parameters that have caused some controversy? Well, in 2014, the American Society for Parental and Natural Nutrition changed their guidelines to increase the osmolarity of peripheral parental nutrition from 600 to 900 milliosmoles for safe infusion. Then MAGIC, the Michigan Appropriateness Guide for Intravenous Catheters, indicated that midlines could be used for up to 14 days, but not to be used for peripherally non-compatible infusates. The problem is they didn't really designate exactly what those peripherally non-compatible infusates were. And then in 2016, the Intravenous Nursing Society took pH drug parameters and requirements out of the standards of care and eliminated them from the device selection criteria. And in 2017, they published this list of non-cytotoxic vesicant medications and solutions. However, 
Most of them just listed the drugs and did not give any concentration requirements. In July of 2019 and 2020, the Association for Vascular Access sent a survey to its membership in relation to device utilization. This was one of the questions that was asked. Does your administration require or request your team to place peripheral catheters, that meaning short peripheral catheters or midlines, in place of PICs or centrally inserted catheters for the purpose of CLABSI reduction? The choices of the answer was either it current, is current policy, it's an informal policy, that it's trending towards policy, or that they would never do that. So in the result, the orange bar is the result of the July 2019. Then we have a blue and green bar. The blue, uh, we ask in the question uh, what that percentage was uh, pre-COVID, i.e. before prior to last March, and then current practice in July of 2020. So the responses were in 2019, 44% of them said that it was either current policy or and or informal policy. In the pre-COVID of 2020, that increased to 53% and remains to be the current practice at this time. There were approximately 300 respondents in the, each year of the survey. But what are the consequences of midline use versus central venous catheterization? Recall that in the mid-1990s, the use of the midline almost disappeared because of a high complication rate. We did discover that at that time that this was primarily due to the types of drugs and infusates that we were using at that time. So this picture is uh, of a critically ill patient uh, who uh, had an, a vancomycin extravasation. The other problem with midlines, in particular in ICU patients who are ventilated and cannot speak for themselves, as well as pediatric or neonates, is that it is very difficult to detect infiltration or extravasation in the upper arm. And generally, by the time we see it, it's too late, like in the case of this patient. And also the patient is unable to tell the nurse that their arm is hurting. So that leads again to a controversy on what exactly are the safe peripheral uh, infusates for midline use. Well, that was a big question, and I sought uh, some experts uh, to try to address this question. Uh, there were two uh, nurses, two pharmacists, a veterinarian, a veterinary pathologist, and a biostatistician. We put together a protocol, which was supported uh, by BD. The uh, title of the study was the investigation of the role of infusate properties related to midline catheter failure in an ovine model. The purpose was to investigate the role of pH, osmolarity, and non-oncologic cytotoxicity as risk factors for midline catheter failure. This was intended to try to give us some parameters about what would be safe with these levels of drugs. The study design was a clinically simulated, randomized, controlled, blinded preclinical trial. And the null hypothesis was that there would be no difference in vessel injury between the test and the control vessels. So why the ovine model? Well, there's several very good reasons. One is the similarity in the vascular anatomy and physiology. Secondly, that they are the preferred animal model for vascular and cardiology in preclinical investigations. We are able to control the study variables and very importantly, we're able to examine gross macroscopic and histopathologic vessel injury response, something, of course, I don't think many uh, folks would be willing to sign up for in a clinical trial. And then the manageability of the animals in the research facility. So the animals were admitted to the research facility for a seven uh, to 10 day quarantine period for acclimation and evaluation of animal health. The veterinarian then selected 20 black face and white face cross sheep based upon their physical condition. They were randomized to the test leg and the first leg catheterization, and the pathologist was blinded for the histopathology grading. The study was powered at 89% to the vessel injury score, which was a quantitative measure to describe failure that we'll talk about more as we go forward. And the study was approved by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee at the Research Facility of Biosurge in Winters, California. 
preoperative measures uh, for each sheep was a do Doppler blood flow velocity and a catheter to vein ratio at the venipuncture site and the catheter tip. The catheter to vein ratio was done in order to choose the appropriate size catheter uh, for the diameter of the vein. The animal was then intubated and anesthetized. The legs were sheared and then a chlorhexidine uh, scrub and saline rinse was performed. This was repeated after the animal was transferred uh, to the operating room, followed by a chloroprep skin prep. We applied maximum sterile barrier and an 18 gauge 10 centimeter midline catheter was inserted into the cephalic vein of each foreleg. Following insertion, there was an antimicrobial and hemostatic disc was placed around the catheter, followed by sterile gauze and vet wrap. The next day, the infusions began. But before each infusion, an assessment of the leg was performed. The leg was palpated to assess for pain or swelling. An upper leg circumference measure was taken for swelling. Blood aspiration of the catheter followed by a saline flush. Then the infusions were begun. The test and the control solutions were infused at the same rate over the same infusion time period. Dressing was changed on the third day post-operative and then again on day eight. The needless connector was changed every four days. The test and control solutions, as we mentioned before, was randomized to each leg. The three categories of infusates were non-chemotherapy cytotoxic drugs. For this one, the pharmacist chose vancomycin and at the low range of four milligrams per mil. The second category was pH. Doxycycline was chosen as the low pH and given at 10 milligrams per mil. Osmolarity was a clinimix uh, solution that's currently used for parenteral nutrition and the low range of 675 milliosmoles per liter. For the high range, it was vancomycin 10 milligrams per mil, a cyclovir uh, for the high pH uh, of 11.06, and the Clinimix 930 milliosmoles per liter. So you can see in each group, the control received 0.9% normal saline at the same infusion rate as the test drug. So the endpoint criteria, or what was determined to be catheter failure, 14 days, which was the time period recommended for midline use by the MAGIC uh, guidance document, or in terms of failure, Swelling, which was determined by the upper leg circumference of greater than or equal to one centimeter over the baseline for two consecutive days. Pain, and we determined pain by the animal withdrawing or jerking its leg on infusion, flushing, or palpation of the catheterized vein, and was given a score of zero to three and needed to have a score of three on two consecutive days. Leakage from the catheter insertion site and that was observable fluid or drainage from the catheter insertion site that was not due to a, a malfunction of the catheter. And the last one, unresolved catheter occlusion, which was the inability to infuse or withdraw blood times two attempts. Now these four symptoms of catheter failure are the same symptoms that have been frequently reported in the literature um, for midline catheter failure. In the pictures below, this was the Clinimix 930 um, the sheep. And you can see on the left leg, it was very obvious at this point that there was a great deal of swelling. And in fact, um, looking on the picture on the right, you can see that the infiltrate was so extensive that it extended down to the hoof of the animal. When the animal reached the endpoint criteria of 14 days or a symptomatic sign of failure, the animal was euthanized and the necropsy was performed. On necropsy, there was an end block dissection of both test and control catheters starting at approximately six to eight centimeters distal to the insertion site, all the way to the shoulder near the junction with the jugular vein. In this picture, you can see that this is a fairly normal uh, appearance of tissue and one that we would expect to see if there was no uh, damage from the infusate or catheterization. Keep that in your mind, because as we go forward, we'll be able to compare that uh, to the 
dissections that we saw with the drug infusates. After the um, sampling was done, the catheter was infused with normal saline, followed by infusion of 10% formalin for vein and tissue preservation and histopathologic evaluation. The samples were then taken to uh, the pathology lab, and there they, starting at the insertion site, they did serial bread loaf slicing of sections at approximately three millimeter intervals for the length of the catheter and 10 centimeters beyond. The tissues were then trimmed into serial samples for histologic processing and followed by sectioning in about four to six micrometer increments for histologic staining. So from this picture, you can see that we were able to understand exactly what was happening uh, in the area to the tissue in the area of the catheter, as well as beyond the cath catheter to understand what was happening with the uh, reaction from the infusate. Each section was graded on a rank scale. The pathologist chose four indicators of vessel injury. One was inflammation, mural thrombosis, necrosis, and perivascular reaction. Each were graded on a scale of zero to three, so that the total possible score for each section was 16. And that would be zero for perfect health and 16 for severe thrombophlebitis and tissue damage. There were 16 contiguous sections chosen for grading. Eight sections were distal to the catheter tip and eight sections were proximal to the catheter tip. So that a mean vessel injury score was calculated for the 16 sections and compared test and control. Now let's go back to the guidelines now and the changes that were made in regards to osmolarity, Aspen changed their guidelines to increase from 600 to 900 milliosmoles for considered to be safe infusion for peripheral parenteral nutrition. Again, I'm showing you the picture of what a normal sample might look like. Here is the Clinimix 930 milliosmoles per liter. In this case, the leg failed at three days due to swelling. In the Clinimix 675 uh, example, this failed at 13 days because of pain. Looking at the histology then, and what I'm showing in these slides is a section representative uh, below or distal to the um, catheter tip, one at the catheter tip, and one proximal to the catheter tip. So looking at the Clinimix 930, these are the test samples. Again, we see a great deal of thrombotic material in these vessels, and they look very sim similar in terms of the extent of injury, even though the difference was between three, three days and 13 days. So that when they fail, you can see that there's a considerable amount of damage. Comparing this then to the control legs, on the 930 milliosmoles, there was no failure in this vessel. And in the 675, this leg failed at 13 days at the same time as the test catheter due to swelling. Looking at the pH requirement then, which was eliminated from the device selection criteria, we look at the two uh, infusions tested. One was a pH of 11.06 with the acyclovir, and in this case, the vessel failed at nine days due to pain and leaking. For the doxycycline at a pH of 2.12, again, much more extensive damage uh, with the acidic solution and failed at this time at seven days due to pain and swelling. On histological observation, then again, we can see considerable uh, damage of this, these vessels at nine and seven days. Looking then at the controls, for the acyclovir control in this sheep, it also failed at nine days, and this was very painful to this animal. Comparing then to the doxycycline, which was 
also failed, but we don't see a lot of thrombotic response in this vessel, but there was a severe uh, infiltration. For the Intravenous Nursing Society, we talked about the vesicant list that they established in 2017. So they listed them under a red list and a yellow list. The red list being those that would never should never be uh, infused peripherally, but the yellow list was one that you indicated to do with caution. But notice in all of these drugs that they did not, did not give a dose range. So let's see how that works out. So here is the vancomycin, four milligrams. Now it made it to the 14 days as magic would suggest uh, would be safe. However, it did fail on day 14. And again, you can see the considerable amount of uh, extravasation and uh, the symptom for failure was pain. Compare this then to the vancomycin 10 milligrams that failed at one week rather than 14 days. Again, with very extensive uh, damage seen to the tissue and severe extravasation. And of course, this sheep uh, exhibited both pain and swelling. Looking again at the histology, the common thing that we see here is a lot of thrombotic response, whether it's at seven days in, with the vancomycin 10 milligrams or the 14 days with the four milligrams. The point being is when they fail, they fail uh, due to extensive damage. And again, comparing now uh, to the control catheters, and this is another observation that some of the controls did fairly well and they did not fail, but others did fail, whether they were due to thrombotic um, activity beyond the tip of the catheter, but in the controls, most of the damage was associated with the catheter itself. So how does that turn out looking at the numbers? Well, in total, the catheter failure rate was 95% of the test catheters failed prior to day 14, and 60% of the control catheters failed. Looking at the graph then, on the left-hand side, we see the mean vessel injury score, and on the right, we see the mean days to failure. So the blue bar represents the control catheter, the orange, the test catheter, and the days to failure are in the green and yellow bars. So what did we find? We found that of the six groups, two of those were not statistically significantly different between the test and control catheters. But interestingly, if you look at the acyclovir, uh, VIS score um, was almost the same as the VIS score for the vancomycin four milligrams. So again, this is indicating the difference between the test and controls, but in almost all cases, uh, there was a lot of damage and a high VIS score uh, in all of the categories. Now, what, there was one other observation that we made as we looked at the macroscopic uh, and the histologic uh, sections um, was the phenomenon of the occurrence of a fibrin sheath uh, surrounding the catheter as well as mural thrombus. When the mural thrombus and the fibrin sheath were large enough that they come in contact with one another, they became one solid uh, thrombus within the vessel. This is problematic in that when the catheter is removed, more likely than not, these occlusive thrombi will not go away and the vessel now has been permanently damaged. So we've lost a vessel, and the likelihood of recatheterization in these veins uh, is certainly questionable. So in terms of numbers, how did these occlusive pericatheter mural thrombosis compare between the test and control? Here we see that there were three of the drug categories that were statistically significantly higher rate of OPMT in the test catheters than the control. Even though you can see in the four milligram um, vancomycin, it was 225% greater in the test catheters than in the control, but was not statistically significant. So this is a very significant problem in relation to peripheral catheters in terms of preserving the vessel and being able to use them um, for access at a later time. So the conclusion of our study 
was that consideration should be given to limiting midline catheter use to a duration of less than six days to preserve vascular health. Well, how does this compare to the clinical data? Well, let's take a look. Zhu et al. in 2016 compared their use of midline catheter complications to those of the peripherally inserted central catheter complications. They listed them as severe and minor. In the severe complications, they considered phlebitis and infection and DVT. There was no statistically significant difference between the two. They also listed minor complications. Notice what they are. Pain, non-patent, leaking, and edema. These were exactly the same four uh, measures that we used for uh, failure. What they have to understand here is that these are symptoms. They are not complications. They are symptoms of venous and catheter-related thrombosis. And there was a statistically significant difference in the midline catheter and the PIC. When they looked at total complications for minor and severe, there was statistically significant difference between the midline and the PIC with the midline at a much higher rate. I was really intrigued when I saw the conclusion by these authors when they stated that midline catheters are an acceptable alternative modality to PIC use to reduce clabsies, despite the potential increase in non-severe complications reported herein. This is what is very concerning in that these are not minor complications. They are signs of vessel damage. Dr. Ball also looked at differences in outcomes with the midline catheter and the PIC catheter. When he looked at the thrombosis rate, both DVT and SVT, there was a statistically significant difference between the PIC and the midline. There was no difference in the incidence of pulmonary embolism between the two, and very interestingly looked at events contralateral to the side of the midline or the PIC, and found that there was no difference in DVT or SVT on the contralateral side. This is a very interesting observation, and one that has been cited in other um, papers in the literature, a finding of contralateral or distant events when there is a catheterized vessel. We did see a very high incidence of failure in the controlled catheters receiving normal saline. And we believe that there may be some issue here as well, uh, a failure related to uh, a catheterized vein on the contralateral side. A very interesting observation. And a third one, looking at infection, which is the whole reason why we as clinicians seem to feel that we can use peripheral catheters in place of central venous catheters to avoid infection. But Dr. Kovacs and his group, when looking at CLABSI compared to non-CLABSI, and in this case, they looked at both peripheral or short peripheral catheter infection as well as midline infection, and found that there was a statistically significant difference between central line and non-central line infection rates. In addition, unlike many papers, they looked at metastatic infection comparing central catheters to non-central catheters. And here you can see in terms of complicated bacteremia, septic thrombophobitis, and so forth, that there were statistically significant differences in the occurrence of these events in the, in the non-central catheters. Also notice the mortality no difference in mortality rates between the two. Well, that's the data. So what else do we see from observing the experience of vascular access specialists? So we're now back to the AVA survey that we did in 2019 and 2020. These results are from the 2020 um, survey. The question was, how often is your recommendation for a PIC or central line as the optimal device for the patient's therapy not followed due to CLABC risk? 55% of the specialists said sometimes or frequently. 
and 45% seldom or never. Second question, has the administrative policy to use PVADs for the purpose of CLABC reduction impacted your ability to provide the optimal device and the best outcome for the patient? 71% of the specialists said yes or sometimes, and only 29 said no. What percent of patients that you see would you classify as DIVA? That is difficult intravenous access. The mean was 64%. This is telling us that by exhausting peripheral veins, that we are losing the ability to catheterize these patients and ultimately will only have the choice of central venous catheterization, even if it's for drugs or treatment that doesn't warrant a central line. And the last question here, what percent of patients are you unable to insert a PVAD or PIC due to repeated PVAD placements? 60% of the respondents said 25% of the time. This really gives us pause to try to understand exactly what we are doing uh, by utilizing peripheral devices in place of central catheters when they are indicated. So what is the patient's experience with these kinds of catheters? Well, this is a picture of a complication that was cited by a patient on Facebook. She says in her post, I told my nurse I want to talk to the doctor, and she checked for blood return, and there is none. She said the doctor said that they are aware and want to see if Tylenol helps. If it doesn't, then they will come and see me. I'm so frustrated. It's nothing but I told you so's to these doctors. It makes them look so pathetic. I've been going through this stuff longer than some of them have been doctors. And now I want to share an email that I received uh, last June uh, from a vascular access specialist appealing uh, their case in regard to midline. It started with, hello, Dr. Ryder. I would like to promote the institution of a midline program at my hospital, but in having a hard time transitioning from the 2011 INS standards of practice concerning what can be infused via midline catheter to the INS standards in 2016, which basically throws all 2011 standards regarding pH and osmolarity out of the window. We currently place over 1,000 ultrasound guided IVs per month to avoid the placement of central lines. It's been great for the reduction of CLABSI, but the peripheral veins are burnt up to the point that I'm ready to hand in my resignation. I doubt midlines will work at this point anyways, because the hemodilution is now lost due to the thrombosis of all the forearm veins bilateral. So basically we have only proposed, postponed the inevitable. These patients could have had a warranted pick line for infusions, in many cases for over a month, of irritants recommended to be infused via central line. Now they aren't even a candidate for that, and on the next admission, they will be needing a tunneled chest line. It has gotten so bad that many of our dialysis patients' legs veins are being used for routine IV access per physician order. It is a shame that it has come to this, but I don't know what else to do. Patients are being hurt to avoid clapsy, and vascular access is such an important, unimportant piece of our hospital that nobody seems to care. At first, I thought they were great to have for the patient to minimize vena puncture and preserve veins, but it has turned out to be just the opposite. They claim to be preserving dialysis patients' veins by placing ultrasound-guided PIVs in every vessel until there's nothing left and all vessels are thrombosed. They would have been better off just placing the pick. What else can I do? If the practice doesn't change, it's just going to get worse. Anyway, if you consider sending me more information on your midline study, it would be greatly appreciated. I would share too that I communicated with him uh, and sent him a copy of the research paper and asked him how things were going. And sadly, he said, nothing has changed. So what are the takeaways? First, Drug properties and the duration of therapy are significant factors in the device selection process. Peripheral vascular access device use in place of PICs or central lines when indicated is not 
an appropriate choice for CLABSI aversion. We must rely on vascular access specialists and teams to select the best choice for the best outcome and the least risk for patient harm. And lastly, vessel preservation is a major patient safety concern beyond the ICU. I thank you for being with us today. I hope this message will help you in your practice, patient safety activity and call to action and to prevention of patient harm. And so with that, I want to turn this over to Dr. Gregory Shears. Hi everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Marcia, for an excellent presentation. So for my part of this, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, why I performed this meta-analysis. Uh, so why was there really a need for it? There were some meta-analyses around the same topic uh, a number of years ago that were completely inconsistent with what my recent clinical experience has been, and also some recent literature that were more focused on current best practice. And the other thing that really bothered me about these uh, meta-analyses were that there was a, a disproportionate focus on some outcomes like uh, deep venous thrombosis, which I was a little bit surprised by. We've known for a long time that there's an association of DVT with catheters in general, regardless of the type. And I would, what surprised me was that it seems like most people didn't know about that, number one. And they also weren't aware of the relationship, the causal relationship of what, uh, how these occurred. So it was curious that this whole business got so much traction and that I guess people weren't paying attention to the critical issues that cause deep venous thrombosis. So that, that part bothered me, particularly when there was pushback related to use of some catheters uh, as a consequence. When I uh, dug into the uh, meta-analysis uh, a little bit more in detail, I found that there was really a bias that was created due to using data that was way too old so that the, the papers reflected uh, uh, clinical studies that were decades old and certainly not reflective of current best practice. Hence, that methodology would have introduced a tremendous bias into the study, which subsequently would lead to misunderstandings of the truth. So because of all of this, I was really concerned about the negative impact. So this journey to uh, create this meta-analysis on my part was a long one. It, it took some time as I was grumbling about, oh boy, people are really being informed incorrectly and leading them down a pathway of making bad decisions regarding uh, device choice. So for me, uh, you know, I'm a clinician 75% uh, of the time at least, and I don't like to be restricted in my, my tool bag regarding what my choices are. I wanna choose the right device for the right occasion based on uh, clinical need. And uh, when I start to see guidelines coming out that are uh, incorrectly biasing people a certain way, uh, I really worry that people are going to make bad choices for patients. Now, those of us that live and breathe this stuff are paying attention to the data. We come up with our own uh, evaluation and we can make good choices, but most people don't have time for that. There's so much information out there uh, in all respects, and we often focus in our areas of interest. So, uh, and people often drift towards guidelines because they want to know, they want to help her, you know, because they can't read all of this stuff. So I, I was really worried about the negative impact of this misleading information. And so I asked the question, would a more recent literature evaluation lead to more appropriate and correct guidance and information on this topic? So that was the genesis of this meta-analysis. And so I performed this meta-analysis using the same technique that the prior meta-analysis from these same two topics was performed. It's a standardized uh, research tool called PRISMA, and it's a preferred reporting items for systemic reviews and meta-analysis. And I use the same target population, and that is adult patients, inpatient and outpatient greater than 18 years of age, who had uh, PICS for venous catheterization, or six centrally inserted central venous catheter as a comparison. And I'm using that term since it's growing in popularity compared to using like CBC, which is kind of more of a generic term, uh, so sick referring to the like right atrial catheter or subclavian catheter. And outcomes were focused on two main outcome variables, um, deep venous thrombosis and CLABSIs. 
uh, the study design was limited to systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and comparative randomized and non-randomized um, study. And uh, the hardest part of all in doing this was trying to figure out what is the, what are the best search parameters from a timing standpoint that one could say this is going to reflect um, best practice, current best practice. And so as I was thinking back and trying to determine this, um, there's trade-offs that you have to have. Do you, if you do it too close, you know, so this is the year 2020, if you do it, let's say 2019, you're not going to have very many studies to review. Uh, and if you do it too far back, you get bias of old studies. And so um, I thought about, okay, well, when did the bundle occur for central venous access? And when did the vascular access community really start to pay attention to things like catheter to vein ratio? When were we talking about it? When would we likely have begun to pay attention to that catheter vein ratio in placement. So I, I chose January 1st, 2006, and basically that's how it happened. I just went back and forth and tried to pick that ideal time and then, okay, boom, that's it. Going forward, that is, those are the limits of my data query and then let the data speak for itself. So the, the, as I mentioned already, central line associated complications that I focused on were the two biggies that right now we're really focusing on. And that is central line associated with bloodstream infection, CLABSIs. We all know that um, CLABSIs have, a, have had and still do have a tremendous negative impact on, on clinical care. With updated numbers, the um, cost in US dollars is around 45,000 per episode. And you know, you can easily see how that can be the case. Prolonged ICU days, addition of antibiotics, all of the care required in order to deal with it on average. Uh, also, of course, there's associated mortality with CLABSI. Uh, fortunately, thanks to uh, paying attention to the bundle, we've made a tremendous improvement in these numbers so that CLABSI risks have fallen to uh, by over 70% compared to a decade ago. And now they're on average around uh, 1.65 per thousand central line days, which is a tremendous accomplishment. And I'm, I'm sure many of you, if you're involved in getting data monthly with um, central lines, you may see many uh, months in your ICUs or maybe even throughout your entire hospital where there's zero clabs, which, you know, if you would have asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, I don't know that that's possible, but just goes to show you pay attention to the best practice and amazing things are possible. So with regard to deep venous thrombosis, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, pick related DVT rates have been out there. And, you know, if you go back far enough, people weren't paying attention at all to catheter to vein ratio. As a matter of fact, in vascular access in general, go big or go home has been kind of a, a pervasive attitude. And now with contemporary thought, this is wrong. We have to think more about venous preservation. We have to think about the venous depletion that occurs by using oversized catheters. And that's across the board. Uh, that's with uh, peripheral IV catheters, for example, as an anesthesiologist, my first go-to catheter in an adult is no longer a 20 or an 18 gauge. It's an, a 22 gauge, a long 22 gauge. Why? Because I would like my patients to leave with veins intact and that I'm not thrombosing off the veins. Now, if I have to do a big case, I don't care if it's the ICU or the OR, I'm going to put in larger catheters to ensure that I can resuscitate and give them higher volume fluids, large volumes of blood, you know, that sort of thing. But on a percentile basis, that's a really low percentage of um, patients. The vast majority that just need fluid resuscitation or slower infusion of blood or whatever can get away with much smaller catheters. So we have to change this conversation and the attitude that it's not macho to um, place oversized catheters. It, what is smart is to give a smaller catheter and let a patient leave the hospital with veins intact or to have a management strategy to allow for venous preservation, whatever that is. So the idea that the pick related DVT rates were previously so high is largely based upon people not paying attention to this issue of catheter to vein ratio. And in recent years, uh, more than a decade now, people have been beginning to really pay attention to this, at least in the vascular access circles. And also manufacturers have paid attention to this and have made products that are so much better thanks to material science. So they can make smaller catheters that can 
the same uh, flow uh, uh, characteristics of the larger catheter because the materials are stronger and the lumens, though are the same or maybe larger, the external size of the catheter is smaller. So you can accomplish a similar or identical clinical treatment with smaller catheters because of the thinner walls of the catheters. Just like with CLABSI reduction, when people have paid attention to this issue of catheter vein ratio and with material science improvement of catheters, the DVT rates with PIC catheters has dropped significantly. So um, again, we see a parallel here. People are paying attention to the issue and with best practice, there's a reduction in frequency. So again, that's why I reacted as I did to this older meta-analysis that grouped all prior studies. And it, it, first of all, I have to say my hat's off to this group. They're an amazing group that has done a lot of research and that's a very hard thing to do. What I reacted to and continue to react to is this provided potentially inaccurate information by including old studies. And I, on the second line here, you can see that uh, within this meta-analysis, studies were included as far back as 1926. And it also lacked a comprehensive consideration of factors beyond catheter type that can uh, influence uh, a meta-analysis. So if you take an evaluation, a meta-analysis, which people regard as the highest level of uh, scientific inquiry, and the next thing right below that, that is prospective randomized trial. If you take this, but you create a bias in your data, your end output, your results are going to be biased uh, and hence give incorrect information for things like the guidelines, such as the magic guidelines. So, and so this meta-analysis directly influenced these guidelines, which could again lead clinicians that don't pay attention to the details down the wrong pathway and force them to make incorrect decisions for patients. So here's the title of my meta-analysis. Peripherally inserted central catheters inserted with current best practice have a low deep vein thrombosis and central line associated bloodstream infection risk compared with centrally inserted central catheters, a contemporary meta-analysis. So again, the purpose of this meta-analysis was to provide a comprehensive comparison of current PIC and sick use in terms of CLABSI risk and patient-centered outcomes. And as I said before, I used the exactly same methodology as the, that prior meta-analysis, but I looked at contemporary data starting from 2006. And I was pretty certain where this was going to go because of a recent um, internal study at Mayo that was done by some of my colleagues. I wasn't involved in it at all, but they used recent best practice compared to groups that had uh, comparable, very good outcomes. So the meta-analysis outcome study, as I said before, included the two big variables, uh, CLABSI, central line associated bloodstream infection, and uh, deep venous thrombosis. I also looked at uh, some subgroup analysis to try to get some more information uh, related to things that might contribute uh, to this. So you'll see that in just a little bit. So my meta-analysis showed a 48% decrease in CLABSI risk with patients that had PICs compared to six. Well, how can that be? That seems you know, pretty dramatic and remarkable. Um, and I think there's different reasons for that. One is that, um, uh, as I mentioned before, the limits of my assessment were from 2006 to uh, 2018. And if you remember in 2006, Nurses, uh, PIC nurses were way ahead of uh, physicians on a percentile basis regarding best practice for insertion. Nurses have been leading with providing uh, best practice bundles even before bundles um, existed in terms of doing maximum sterile barrier and, and really being very meticulous about insertion. Physicians, I think, were a little bit slower to get on board with uh, these best practices, but with time, education, more information about the bundle, CMS penalties, you know, we've kind of gotten on board and, and uh, drifted uh, closer to what's uh, considered to be current best practice. You know, I, I say all this because uh, PICS and six, when you think about from a material standpoint and other things, they're very similar and they're used under similar circumstances. So likely, once we get best practices for both aligned, probably the CLABSI risk will be coming together uh, to have almost no difference.
I think including data reaching back to uh, 2006, likely you see more of some of that bias of the better insertion of practice by uh, nurses. Bottom line is that there's no reason that one should think PICs are at higher risk for CLABS income. And this analysis would suggest that there's um, advantages to it, uh, probably with time and continued attention to best practice that, that difference will narrow. The other important outcome variable is the rate of deep venous thrombosis. So uh, if you look at, as I looked at the data associated with smaller French size PICs, there was actually uh, no difference or even a lower risk of DVT with the PICs compared to six. So people that were on board with using four French PIC catheters, be they single or double lumen, had a very low rate of um, symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic um, DVT. If patients had larger French size PICs, um, there was an increased likelihood of having uh, a DVT. So, uh, this shouldn't, again, surprise anyone. If people are paying attention to best practice and using the smallest possible PIC catheter French size, they are going to have a significantly lower risk of thrombosis. And if you choose a larger one for a given vein, you're going to have an increased likelihood of a DVT. So this study supports the fact that if you're paying attention to current best practice, and placing the smallest French size you can, um, you're going to bias towards a very low risk of DVT. Thank goodness material science has improved, as I mentioned before, because we can do things with a four French double that um, 10 years ago we would be doing with, let's say, a five French double. So we should always keep this in mind, use the smallest catheter available, and the other thing I've noticed within our, our practice is that if you set up your order sets so that the default setting is the, the smaller French catheters, you're more apt to get that as an order if that is a problem within your system. Certainly it was within ours initially because it takes a long time for the information to filter through to people that aren't focused on a given area like vascular access. They don't realize catheter materials have improved so much and that um, you can now have thinner walled catheters that can accomplish the same thing that these larger catheters used to accomplish. So all important things to pay attention to and within your practice to help clinicians make the right choices if you're not the ones that are there to help them to make the choice. So we did a number of subgroup analyses as part of our, um, our results and uh, some interesting findings uh, came from that. One is that um, dedicated PIC teams were associated with higher first insertion success rates and lower rates of uh, complications. If you pay attention at all to the medical literature, this should be a, no surprise. Anytime that an expert is repetitively doing the same thing correctly, you're going to have a lower rate of complications. Uh, so Vince Lombardi, a famous uh, football coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the 1960s, used to say, practice doesn't make perfect, but best practice or perfect practice makes perfect. So that's very analogous here. If you're practicing best practice repetitively, you're going to have way fewer patient complications. If you're practicing repetitively but not using best practice parameters, you're going to have repetitive errors uh, and repetitive complications. So pay attention to what contemporary best practice really is. We also found that using lower lumen catheters were associated with a reduced CLABSI risk. This is consistent with data that's been in the literature over the past you know, two decades, um, and it sort of makes sense. Uh, lower number of lumens associated with reduced CLABSI risk. And that's true with PICs as well. What is this about? There may be a, a selection bias associated with that because as clinicians, hopefully we're always choosing the lowest number of lumens that we can with a, for a given patient. And we choose the number of lumens based on what the practice parameters are, what the, the clinical needs are. Uh, and if we, um, so the selection bias that I'm talking about might be that a patient that's needing three lumens um, uh, may be sicker, may be on more vasoactive substances, has more things going on, et cetera. In the old days, uh, when we had uh, you know six French triples that we were using, 
a six French in the same size vein is going to be much more likely to have a DVT compared to the now newer, more modern catheters that have five French triples and are going to be, because of their smaller size, less prone to DVT compared to the old days. And as time goes on, material science continues to improve and there'll be other materials that are maybe even better to help reduce the, the rate uh, frequency of thrombosis and or CLABSI. But you know, we're, we're in a better spot now than we were 10 years ago without a doubt. So um, it's important to, again, keep up with best practice, best materials, things like that. Another subgroup category was that the CLABSI risk, as I mentioned before, the risk with PICS was lower than with six. And I already gave you an explanation as to why I think that was the case. And lastly, uh, there's very good evidence to suggest that uh, bundling um, seems to help reduce CLABS. You've seen that in a number of different studies that, uh, as I said before, over the last decade, 15 years, we've um, noted a dramatic reduction in CLABS risk thanks to following best practice and the bundling. So how does this review, this meta-analysis differ from other literature reviews? It was inclusive of all typical catheter dependent populations. It focused on uh, a multitude of outcomes. I talked a little bit about the subgroup analysis. Um, it considered articles from 2006 for, and, and to the present, which um, helps us to address current best practice and not old ways that would bias data. So it's a more contemporary analysis than the prior meta-analysis. Interestingly, an Italian group asked similar questions. First author, uh, Bal Serrano, uh, uh, and they found that looking just at DVTs, that PICS had a, um, a rate of thrombosis of only 2.4%, which was very consistent with our findings, of a very low rate, um, because they looked at uh, contemporary studies and more recent uh, best practice. And it's DVTs are not a given with PICS. As long as you're paying attention to current best practice, the rate is actually quite low. So the implications uh, for practice from this study, you can't just consume papers and look at the conclusion, look at the title and draw conclusions. So uh, question the data, question the guidelines. Um, and you, you have to delve a little bit deeper, particularly if it doesn't make sense based on your clinical experience. And that's what I did. Um, choose the correct device for your patient based on therapeutic need and not on fear, but on sound, a sound assessment of what the patient requires to complete their um, therapeutic goals and uh, what their um, access opportunities are. Follow best practice changes and outcomes. This meta-analysis is a great example of why we must pay attention to best practice and promote them. Not everybody um, has the time uh, or the interest to pay attention to this. So within our own practices, within our hospitals or other uh, communities, we have to be champions regarding what best practice is. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, contemporary practice significantly reduces complications. So let's try to be on board with that and do those things the best that we can. When adhering to best practices, this study demonstrated that concerns related to peripherally inserted central catheters and deep thrombosis, uh, deep vein thrombosis are minimized, and that uh, dramatic changes to clinical practice over the last 10 years has really helped to address these issues with uh, central catheters and complication risks. Given the lower rate of complications when following current guidelines, clinicians should prioritize central line choice based on patient therapeutic needs rather than fear of complications. Future research should continue to consider contemporary literature over antiquated data, such that it recognizes the implications of current best practice with modern central catheter choices. The best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered, I think is the right guideline, the right beacon that we must have as we're making choices for patients or collaborating with them and advising them for optimal choices. Well, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and um, listening to this uh, webinar. It's been fun putting it together and, um, and gathering up all this information to reassure me, and I hope you, that um, by following current best practice, the rates of complications are actually very low. 
here is my uh, contact information if you have any additional questions. Um, so take care, everyone, and keep practicing best practice. Bye-bye.